Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello. My name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here before, never watched any of my videos, have no idea what I do here on my channel. I cover true crime cases and all of the cases that I cover are a little bit older. They're all basically 20 years or older. So if that's something that you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click that subscribe button and also make sure to turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that I upload. So today's case that I have for you all, it's one that took place not far from where I live currently. I live about 45 minutes away from Cincinnati, Ohio. I live in Kentucky. And the case that I'm covering, it's one that I've wanted to cover on my channel for quite some time, for probably over a year now, and I've just kind of put it to the side. But I was watching the news the other day and I never really watched the news. Coincidentally, they were talking about today's case and I figured this is a sign. It's finally time to cover it on my channel, so that is what I'm doing today. So with all that being said, let's just get right into the case. So this story takes place, like I said, in Cincinnati, Ohio, and it revolves around a father, a mother, and their very young daughter. I'm going to give a little bit of a background about the parents first before I dive into the actual case. The father was Gerald John Bricka. Most people called him by his nickname, Jerry, so I'll be calling him that in this video. He was born in San Francisco, California on January 25th of the year 1938 to parents Elmer Constantine Bricka and Dolores Yvonne White Bricka. The mother was Linda Jane Bricka, who was born Linda Jane Bulaw in Barrington Hills, Illinois on January 4th of the year 1966 to parents Adolph Bulaw and June Miller Bulaw. Although Jerry was originally from California and Linda was originally from Illinois, they had actually met in Seattle, Washington after Linda's family had moved there and Jerry was also living there in the area at the time. Jerry and Linda, they fell in love. It was a beautiful love and they ended up getting married in Seattle in the year 1961. Life came at them pretty fast at this time and the next year after they tied the knot, they welcomed their first and only child, their daughter, Deborah Ann Bricka, who was born on June 6th of 1962. After their daughter was born, they decided to move and the place that they desired to move to was none other than Cincinnati, Ohio. They moved there in 1963 and moved into a home sitting at 3381 Greenway Avenue. It was a cute little home, still standing today, three stories, had a basement, the main floor, and an upstairs, just an adorable family home. It was located in the Bridgetown neighborhood, which was overall a really great neighborhood to live in, especially for a growing family. It was definitely a family-oriented neighborhood and genuinely just known as a safe area to live. When they were living in Seattle, Linda had been working as a flight attendant, but after their daughter was born and after they moved to Cincinnati, she decided to be a stay-at-home mom. And Jerry was working as a chemical engineer for the company at Monsanto. Since Linda was a stay-at-home mom and wasn't bringing in any income, Jerry worked a lot and he was a very hard worker. He wanted to provide for his family. He didn't want them struggling and he just wanted to be the best husband and father he could be. This is how their life was for quite a few years. Jerry worked, Linda stayed at home taking care of their daughter and doing the housework and cooking. Although this was their main focus, they did have their fun as well and they made sure to get to know others living in their neighborhood. They would throw cookouts and parties and invite everyone in the neighborhood to join in. They were a very well-liked family in that neighborhood for sure. Now, fast forward some to the year of 1966. By September of that year, Jerry was 28 years old and his wife was 23. Linda had been a stay-at-home mom for years, but she wanted to go back to work and had recently taken up a part-time job at Glenway Animal Hospital. She was working under a known veterinarian in the area named Dr. Fred Leininger. We'll talk more about him very soon. You could say that the Bricka family, they were living a life that a lot of Americans wanted to at the time. They were a loving family and people gravitated to them. A mother and a father who cherished each other with a little girl now four years old in 1966. That was their entire world, an American dream that would basically turn into an American nightmare. September 25th of 1966 would be a day 
that would be marked down in Cincinnati history. Since we do not know the exact details surrounding that night, we're starting at two days later on the 27th when neighbors started realizing something was a bit off. In a tight knit neighborhood, when something is out of the norm, people notice very quickly and that's exactly what happened. September 27th of 1966 was a Tuesday and people living nearby started realizing, hmm, we haven't seen the Brickas in a couple days now. They haven't been outside, their cars have not been moved, the trash bins have not been taken in, the newspaper has not been picked up, and their dogs have been barking inside and not been taken out to use the restroom. This is not like them. The last time anyone had seen any of the Brickas was days before on the 25th when Jerry had brought out the trash. The Brickas and next door neighbors were the Myers, and it was Richard Meyer who was really the first person to notice something was wrong. He was the person who threw the daily newspaper up on the Brickas porch and realized that they never came out to get it. The Myers decided to phone the Brickas home, but when they called, there was no answer. There was a feeling in the pit of Richard Meyer's stomach, a feeling we only feel a few times in our lives, a feeling where you know that the outcome is probably not going to be a good one. After no one answered at the brick of home, Richard Meyer decided to walk over to their house. And when he got up to the porch, he sees that their door, their front door was left slightly open. It was ajar. That feeling in his stomach, it got more intense. He doesn't wanna walk inside by himself. So he goes back to his home and he gets in contact with another close neighbor. And this man's name was also Richard. Richard Jansen. This neighbor, Richard Jansen, apparently had made a call to Jerry's work only to find out that Jerry had not been heard from in two days. The two men, they decide to head over to the brick of home together and check everything out. As soon as they walk inside the home, they are overtaken by a putrid smell, a smell that most of us wish to never smell in our entire lives, the smell of death. Richard Jansen had served in World War II. So he knew this smell all too well and it honestly probably triggered a bit of PTSD for him. The two Richards, they walk upstairs and go into Jerry and Linda's bedroom. This is where they find the couple's lifeless bodies. Jerry was face down on the ground right between the couple's bed and the wall. Linda was facing up and her body was on top of her husband's. The two men, they are in complete shock at this point, sick to their stomachs, but in their mind, they're wondering where Debbie is. They search the home some more, hoping more than anything that she is still alive and possibly hiding somewhere, but she isn't. Debbie Bricka's body would be found on the floor in her own bedroom. Richard Meyer and Richard Jansen rush out of the home, find the nearest phone they possibly could, and they call the police. Now we're entering the investigation. Authorities arrived at the scene rather quickly. It was the Hamilton County Sheriff's Office put on the case. They started going over the crime scene immediately taking notes of everything that they could. The front and the back door of the home were both shut when they got there. But as we know, it was slightly open when Richard Meyer and Richard Jansen got there. So I'm guessing that either one of them had shut the door while leaving the home. There were no signs of a forced entry anywhere. No doors that seemed to be forced open, no broken windows, nothing of the sort. Strangely, the Bricka family, they did have two dogs. The dog's names were Thumper, mostly a poodle breed, and Dusty, mostly a Cocker Spaniel breed. And from everything I read, these dogs were a little aggressive at times. These dogs were known for being very protective of their family. And when police got to the home and were checking everything out, they were told the family had these two dogs. Well, the two dogs would be found locked in a room of the home near the back of the home. The dogs, they were completely unharmed. But the crazy thing is that the dogs, if it was someone they didn't know had entered the home and taken the life, of the family, the dogs would have barked and no one heard any barking the night of the 25th. Neither Jerry or Linda would have locked their own dogs in the room for any reason. So the murderer was, we're still guessing today, was most likely the one who put the dogs in the room and, and locked them in there. Due to the dogs not barking the night of the murders, police started figuring very early on that the murderer may have been someone that the family knew very well. 
enough so where the dogs wouldn't have barked. Police looked around the living room and the kitchen. It seemed Linda had been in the process of doing laundry because some folded laundry was on the couch and some damp clothes were still in the washer. The family, this is very important, had a knife set in their kitchen and this set was from India and one of the knives was missing from the set, which was odd because the couple, they had a four-year-old little girl and because of that, they always kept the knives away in one of the kitchen drawers. So if someone took it, they had to have known that it was in the drawer, unless they just went around looking for a knife beforehand. The home though itself, it didn't look in complete disarray. It did not seem like someone had come in and just ransacked the place. It didn't look like a robbery, but Jerry's wallet was found empty on his bed, which maybe it wasn't originally a planned robbery. Maybe that wasn't the original motive and maybe just the killer after taking their lives decided to also take some money from his wallet. But we are not exactly sure how much money he had in his wallet or if he had any money at all in his wallet. It was just empty. Now, as for the bodies of Jerry, Linda, and Debbie. Jerry had all his clothes on except shoes. A sock had been stuffed in his mouth. A small piece of tape was left on his face, which suggested he and Linda had been bound at some point, but it seemed what they were bound with was taken off at some point, either before or after they were killed. It seemed that rope may have been used as well to bound them other than tape, but no rope was found in the room. Linda had a coat over her nightgown. And like I said, she was found on top of her husband. Hemp rope would later be found in the garage and it was guessed to be Jerry's hemp rope that he owned, but it was also guessed that this was the rope that was possibly used to tie them up. So again, if Jerry's hemp rope was used in the bounding, it had to have been somebody who possibly knew that that was out there. And Debbie, she was wearing a little flannel nightgown and she had on one red sock. The other red sock was found on her bed. Police dusted the home for fingerprints. They would end up finding one not seeming to be any of the three victims. Other than this fingerprint, they found hair on Linda's palm that was none of the three victims. And they ended up taking a swab from Linda's vaginal cavity, which showed semen. Authorities would take quite a bit from the home to put in their evidence bin, such as the victim's clothing, towels that had blood on them, and the sheets on the bed. Another thing taken from the scene was a smoked Marlboro cigarette, which also course had DNA on it that didn't seem to belong to any of the three victims. Autopsies would be performed on Jerry, Linda, and Debbie. Jerry and Linda's heads had been penetrated by a sharp object that was not said to be a knife, but they had also been stabbed in their chests and back. Jerry a total of nine times and Linda a total of eight. Poor Debbie, she was stabbed four times and she was stabbed so intensely that the knife had gone straight through her tiny body. To say that this triple murder was gruesome would be an understatement. The knife and the other sharp object, they were never found. One of the newspapers from the family's front porch was missing, so authorities did guess that maybe the killer used the newspaper to wrap the bloody knife and sharp object in and dispose of it somewhere. Hamilton County Detective Brian Williams told Fox 19 recently, who would have the ability to murder a four-year-old? That's, wow, I don't know. I don't even want to even think about the kind of mind frame you have to be able to do that. The person who did the initial autopsies was coroner Dr. Frank P. Cleveland, and he was not able to tell, and we still in today's time are not able to tell, the order in which the murders happened in. Based on the fact though that Linda's father had phoned their home and talked to Linda around 10 p.m. on Sunday, but no one answered the phone that next morning at 6.30 a.m. when Jerry's employer called, it was believed the family was murdered sometime between those times. Jerry was actually set to fly to West Virginia the next morning for a business trip, which is possibly another clue pointing to whoever being responsible, possibly knowing the family well, because if they had waited just one more night to commit the murders, 
Jerry would have been gone. One of their neighbors, Judith Hemmer, would end up telling WCPO, we were all scared. Everybody got big dogs and deadbolt locks and didn't sit on the porch at night anymore and didn't walk up and down the sidewalks. Here on my channel, I've talked a lot about different cases that happened back in the day, and of course they still happen today, where the murders just completely changed the town. And this murder, along with other ones that I'm gonna talk about very soon, it changed Cincinnati forever. The investigation it was an intense one with over 400 people questioned very early on. One of the main people originally questioned and looked into was none other than Richard Meyer, the next door neighbor who started noticing something was off at the Bricka home. He was cleared almost immediately of having any involvement in their murders though. The Meyer home would end up receiving very harassing phone calls from people tormenting him and saying he was the one who did it though. Richard's wife, she would, actually be the one who came to police after the murders to tell them of a suspicious man she saw walking back and forth on the street on the Thursday before the murders took place. She stated that she saw this man walking while she was in her garage painting tables with the garage door open and she claimed she unfortunately did not get a very good look at this man so because of that because she couldn't give a description to police because they couldn't do a sketch of this man nothing really came of this. Of course, they would ask people in the neighborhood if anybody else had seen this man, if anybody else saw anybody else lurking around the area near around the times when the murder took place, whether before or after, and nobody really came forward saying the same thing that Mrs. Meyer did. The Bricka family murder, it really changed this area of Cincinnati, like I said, but Cincinnati, was not unfamiliar with murders at this time because there had been quite a few murders recently and the person responsible for these murders was being referred to at the time as the Cincinnati Strangler. I understand that the Cincinnati Strangler, this is not believed to be the person, the serial killer responsible for what happened to the Brickas, but I do wanna kind of touch on the Cincinnati Strangler because it is a huge part of Cincinnati history and it was kind of linked to this case. And by linked to this case, I mean that there was a point in history where they thought this unknown serial killer could have been responsible. The Cincinnati Strangler was the name given to an American serial killer who at the time of the Brooka family murders was an unknown individual. And still to this day, a lot of people are not sure we actually have the right person that we think did it. But the serial killer, by definition, is believed to have been responsible for the murders of seven women, all between the ages of 31 to 81. All these women lived in areas of Cincinnati that were known as areas of lower income, and five of the seven victims had been sexually assaulted. The first victim, her name was Imogen Harrington. She was 56 years old and had been strangled to death. On April 4th of 1966, it was 58 year old Lois Dant. She had been beaten, raped, and strangled to death in her apartment. The third victim was June 10th of 1966, and it was 56 year old Matilda Jeanette Messer. She was found in a Cincinnati park, beaten, raped, and strangled to death. The fourth victim was on August 14th of 1966, and it was the youngest of the killer's victims, which was 31-year-old Barbara Bowman, and she was stabbed seven times in her throat by the driver of a taxi. She died after police got to her, and she was able to give them a description of the man responsible and even the taxi driver's license plate number. This taxi actually had been recently reported stolen, and due to the fashion of her murder, they originally thought that she wasn't a victim of the Cincinnati Strangler and still to this day, there is a lot of question as to whether she actually was and whether the person who served time for her murder was actually the Cincinnati Strangler, but that would be an entire other video. But on October 11th of 1966, the killer took the life of 51 year old Alice Hodgehausen. On October 20th, the killer then took the life of 61-year-old Rose Winstall. 
who was found beaten and murdered in her apartment. Then on December 9th, 81 year old Lula Carrick was beaten and strangled in her apartment elevator. A 29 year old man named Postio Lasky Jr. would be arrested for the murder of Barbara Bowman and he would later be convicted of the murder in April of 1967. He was sentenced to the electric chair but his lawyer appealed the verdict because there was not enough evidence in court presented to prove he had been responsible for the six other murders. The court rejected the appeal but in June of 1972 the Supreme Court did change his sentence to life imprisonment with the chance of parole. It has been proven in court he took the life of Barbara Bowman but he never received any convictions for the other six murders. He did have a past of attacking women and robbing women, but there is a lot of speculation as to whether he was actually the Cincinnati Strangler or if the real one was never actually caught. After he was caught though, coincidentally, all the murders in the area stopped, so there is that. At the time of the Brickham murders, the area of Cincinnati had had multiple murders happen already. There was someone in the area taking the lives of people, so authorities kind of just threw the Bricka murders in with the rest of them, but the Bricka murders were very different from the rest. I mean, even Barbara Bowman's was, but of course, that would be for another video. But the Bricka family, for one, they lived in a middle-class area. They didn't live in an area with lower income. It was an entire family, not just one individual. And the Strangler, for the most part, targeted mature women. So the Bricka family, it just didn't make sense that they would have thought the Cincinnati Strangler was possibly responsible for their murders. Linda was only 23 and of course her husband and daughter were also killed as well. As time went on and more clues were looked into, it just honestly didn't seem like the Bricka family was victims of the Cincinnati Strangler, whether it was really posteal or not. Can I say for sure? No, I can't. But most information surrounding the cases just don't really point to that. Either way though, the area of Cincinnati seemed to be terrified for their lives. It seemed like every other week there was another murder and now it was an entire family. So people were, they were, they were taking precaution. Other than the theory that the lives of the Bricka family were possibly taken by the Cincinnati Strangler, there are quite a few theories in this case. This was a well-liked family in a safe area, like we said before. They weren't involved in anything illegal, as far as anyone knows, but as time went on, talk of certain things going on in the couple's lives started coming up in conversation and being told to the authorities working on the case. For one, as I stated before, near the beginning of this video, Linda had semen in her vaginal cavity. An author in current time known as JT Townsend had became a bit obsessed with the case and has talked to many news sources regarding it. He dove into the case greatly. Sheriff Jim Neal gave him basically full access to all of their case files on the case, which is crazy. And JT Townsend, he ended up coming out with a book called Summer's Almost Gone. And this book can be found on Amazon and it goes into great detail about the Bricka family murders. And it includes a lot of theories, some more talked about and some less talked about. Townsend tells Fox 19 just this year, it's 1966. You have this grisly triple homicide that literally swamped the Hamilton County investigators. They were, no offense to them, because they worked hard to solve this with the tools they had in 1966. They were overmatched by a cunning killer who left very few clues. We're talking an alpha male predator here that did this crime. We have covered dozens and dozens of cases on my channel where we have discussed pretty much the same thing. And that is that decades and decades ago, there was no DNA evidence and police did not know how to properly handle a crime scene the way we do today. They had no idea that anything like DNA testing would exist eventually and that they needed to collect as much tiny bit of evidence as they possibly could. Which I have to say though, compared to a lot of other cases I have covered recently, 
They did a better job handling this one than a lot of those. At least with this one, they were a little bit more cautious and even went as far as to take samples from the family's vacuum cleaner and see if they could find anything like vacuumed up in it. Kind of what I just said, Townsend went on to tell Fox 19, nobody knew what DNA was. Still physical evidence in, in Bricka was preserved well enough that they have a DNA tripod consisting of Marlboro cigarette butts, human hair found clutched in Linda Bricka's hand, and seminal fluid that was taken from Linda Bricka that was either from a rape or consensual intercourse. And they never were able to determine was she raped the night of the murder. Now, at the very beginning of this case, after everything happened and they found this fluid inside Linda Bricka's vaginal cavity. There were some headlines in newspapers that stated that she had been raped. And you're probably wondering how they didn't know if she had been raped or not. Based on the way that her body was found, it didn't seem like anyone had forcefully raped her. She and Jerry could have recently had intercourse before the murders or it had come from someone else. But the thing is, is because this is still in question, I would say that they have tested this semen and discovered that it did not come from Jerry, but this information I could not find anywhere online. There has been talk, like with many murders, including couples, if an affair had been going on. With this case, there is talk about Linda, that she possibly could have been having an affair, and there was also talk that Jerry could have also been having an affair, but we're discussing Linda because she's the one who they found semen inside. This is a topic that I, I hate even having to discuss because if there was no affair going on and, and their marriage was one where they were completely committed to each other. I hate even being disrespectful to that, but it is something that I have to mention because it obviously is a bullet point in this case. There's just a lot of talk with this case that there could have possibly been some sort of love triangle going on and that maybe that day Linda had gone out and possibly she saw the person that she was having an affair with behind Jerry's back, but that is just speculation we do not know. Although it did not seem like the sexual intercourse was completely forced, we we don't know. This theory about an affair, about a love triangle, was heavily dove into by JT Townsend and a few of my other sources as well. And as we know, Linda had been working for a Dr. Fred Leininger at the Glenway Animal Hospital. Well, rumors developed that she and her employer had developed a secret romantic relationship and that possibly she refused to leave her husband and that he murdered her and her entire family. Now, I do have to say that there is not a tremendous amount of information out there that points to Leininger being responsible for the murders, but there are a few things that do make him look a little bit suspicious. Police had interviewed the doctor two times within a few day period after the murders happened. The first time was about a 10 minute interview and the second one was about 45 minutes long. A day after his second interview, a lieutenant of the Ohio State Police wanted to question him again, but apparently the second interview really shook up the doctor. The doctor's wife told the lieutenant to phone their attorney if they had any further questions for the doctor. When the lieutenant spoke to the lawyer, the lawyer had a few things that he wanted the authorities to abide by before getting to his clients and the authorities did not agree to these terms at first, but later agreed to them in an attempt to finally speak to Leininger again. Authorities would end up sending over a list of questions that they wanted Dr. Fred Leininger to answer in person. He was able to look over these questions beforehand and he still did not want to answer them. He just did not want to cooperate with authorities anymore and without any hard evidence, there was really nothing that they could do about it. The questions that they wanted answered were not intense. I saw them online. There was 
probably a few less than 10 of them and they were kind of just like, you know, like what's your connection to the Bricka family and when's the last time that you saw Linda Bricka and you know, questions like that. Authorities, they ended up putting Leninger under constant watch until they eventually just gave up. I read over some of the reports of what they gained from watching Leninger and basically the only thing that they really obtained from it was watching him every day and seeing that as the days progressed he started drinking more and more and more and was that because he was just stressed out from them constantly watching him or he was guilty and had something on his conscience? We don't know. Leininger would end up retiring in 1995 and he supposedly committed suicide in the early 2000s. Some reports claim he and his wife committed suicide at the same time, but based on findagrave.com, it stated that his day of death was February 23rd, 2003, and that his wife, Lynn's, was December 7th of 2004. It seems that a lot of people who have done write-ups about this case are also confused about the exact dates and some sources claim she also, that his wife also committed suicide and that they killed themselves together. For the life of me, I could not 100% verify that, but we do know that he did himself take his own life. Other than the things that I just stated before about Leininger, a few other things that could have made him look a little suspicious. For one, the tape found on Jerry's face was said to be medical tape, like a doctor would use. Another thing is that the Bricka's dogs would have most likely not barked at the doctor because they knew who he was. Also, the dogs not barking the night of the 25th, they could have been sedated and a doctor, a vet, would have had something on hand to sedate some dogs. Some neighbors claimed that they heard some barking from the home in the days or so after the murders, but not the night of, which would make sense if the dogs were sedated and then the drugs were off. Another thing that I have to mention is that they have obviously some evidence bags, and this is brought up in a few of my sources and on the actual evidence bag, you can see it's written what's in the evidence bag, but there's actually some of Leininger's hair. And I could not find out if that was the hair that was found in Linda's palm or not. But if it was, with this video, there's probably a lot of plot holes and a lot of things that I can't answer for you, but that's because there are a lot of things about this case that are kept from the public. Leininger had definitely hid behind his attorney, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he was guilty. A lot of people who knew the doctor claimed that he was a pleasant guy, that he was someone that they could have never imagined doing something so heinous. Of course though, we've heard this so many times in the past when it comes to killers, but it leaves people with the question, you know, like why would this doctor have killed them and even their little girl? Because apparently he was very close to this little girl. She even called him, you know, Uncle Fred. People that think that, like I stated before with the whole affair thing that Leininger and Linda were having an affair and that he wanted her to leave her family and that, he took the life of her and her husband and then he took the life of Debbie because she would have recognized him, but of course this is all just theory. But what we know is that Fred Leininger was someone for decades that had question marks, you know, floating around him as to whether he had some involvement in the murder or not. And honestly, only time, even after all this time, only time will tell. Because although this case is quite old, they're still working on it to this day and they're still hoping to come up with more answers and they could have answers right now that they're just not releasing to the public. The next theory, I'm not going to spend too much time touching on this one, but it's one that was dove into by JT Townsend as well. It was actually a theory that he kind of laughed at a bit at the, the beginning and that was the theory that Linda Bricka was targeted by a cult in the area that regularly sacrificed animals. 
As we know, Linda worked at a vet office and she absolutely loved animals. Townsend told Fox 19, I had seven different people that didn't know each other, seven people unrelated to each other, named this individual as the person who got rid of Linda Bricka because she was about to expose what this group was doing. To cut through the rumors of this case really takes a disciplined mind. But if you saw my reaction about the satanic cult when I first got it, <laughs> I'm not laughing about that now because there's too many credible things that have shown up. And as far as I know, the individual that he's referring to in that quote, that name has not been released to the public. It doesn't seem from my research like authorities have dove too deep into this theory, but it is one that is brought up. I also don't think Townsend leans too far towards this theory as well, but I feel like he definitely is keeping an open mind. A lot of people agree though that the theory of them being murdered by a cult, it is a little bit out there. A group that supposedly kills animals for sacrificial purposes, which is heartless and disgusting, that's a very different crime than going in and murdering a married couple and their four-year-old little girl. You get what I mean. There also isn't, at least publicly, a whole ton of evidence to back this one up. Townsend would be quoted by WCPO saying, it wasn't a mob hit, it wasn't a robbery, it wasn't a serial killer, it wasn't a Manson-like cult. These were people who knew the victims, were personally involved with them, and had some kind of massive conflict that apparently they felt there's only one way out of here, and that's to take them out. Another theory brought up in this case is that possibly Jerry or Linda had obtained some sort of information or were involved in something that made them a target. One friend of Linda's would go on to tell Cincinnati Magazine that in the months leading up to their murders, Linda seemed increasingly worried about her daughter's safety. It seems like she was keeping a more intense eye on Debbie. To me though, honestly, this doesn't seem too odd because there had been those recent murders in the area and pretty much the entire community at the time was being more protective of their children and themselves. But still, it is something to keep in mind. A few sources of mine did mention one thing and that was that Linda, while working as a stewardess, had allegedly helped break up a drug ring. I could not find much information regarding this, but some think maybe that this was why she was targeted. But if she was, why was it so many years later? Also, most professional hits on someone do not usually include children and are most often done by a firearm, not a knife. And they're usually not done so intensely and passionately, just so many stabs and and so it really seems like whoever did it knew the family directly and and they had to have had some hatred for some of the members in it there are quite a few more theories out there but most of them do not have much information to back them up and of course so many tips have been called in through the years the two main people of authority who are working on the case now are Detective Brian Williams, who I mentioned before, and Detective Douglas Todd. Williams told WCPO in 2020, technology is always advancing. It might not have been there five or 10 years ago, but it could be there now. Why not resubmit things and give it a try? Todd goes on to say, DNA was not prominent back in 1966. It was there, but the ability to analyze it didn't exist. There might be something 50 years from now that we just don't know about yet that may be able to analyze evidence that may be able to solve it. In the meantime, Todd and Williams said they regularly bounce ideas off each other in the office. We have a desk across from each other and we'll bring up the Bricka case and 45 minutes later, we're still talking, Williams said. And an hour later, Todd said, we're diving back into the folders, revisiting an interview or two, because that's what you have to do. In recent years, in the past few years, it really seems like they are talking more in this area about the Bricka case. There seems to be a lot of it being brought up on the news. And one of the recent ones that I just watched was last week. If you watch very recent news segments on this case, 
it's easy to tell that they are being very hush hush about a lot of things and I feel like that's a good sign. I feel like I feel like they're getting somewhere and we just kind of have to sit here, fingers crossed. Williams told Fox 19 just this past month, we are currently looking into things. I can't say whether it's going to lead to an arrest. I can't say whether it's going to lead to us solving this, but I can say that some of the stuff we've been told or some of the stuff that we're hearing are new to us. Like I always say on my channel, technology is always advancing our forensic technology and I love how I say our forensic technology like I'm doing any of it but like forensic technology is so far ahead of what it even was like three to five years ago. There have been multiple times where they submitted DNA like a few years ago didn't get a hit did it you know not that long ago and got a hit and they solved the case. And in today's time, one of the main things that we have for solving older cases is genetic genealogy. So are they looking into that? I don't have the answers for that and I don't think they're going to give that away to the public, but keep that in the back of your minds because they do have DNA on file from this case. I really tried to dive deep into this case without bringing up every single little thing because there really is so much to look into. And if you do want to learn more about this case and hear about all those other theories, you can always check out JT Townsend's book. I will be linking his book down in the description of this video for you all to check out. No, I'm not like being sponsored or anything like that. I just if you want to learn more, it's down there. I really have my fingers crossed for this case. I think this case has the full potential to eventually be solved. And of course, unfortunately, the person who is responsible or people, there could be multiple. There are a lot of people that think it was multiple people. That individual or those individuals, there's a high chance that they are deceased in today's time. Somebody at some time whether one person or multiple people had some sort of a vengeance against Linda and Jerry, and it doesn't seem like that reason has been discovered yet. Thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your day to hear about this case, because it's definitely one that I've been thinking about a lot lately. And with all that being said, I will see you all in the next video.